Welcome. Hi, I'm Mickey and this is Wikipedia, where I sit down and chat to doctors, professors, athletes, practitioners and experts in their fields related to health, nutrition, fitness and well-being. And I'm delighted that you're here. Kia ora team, it's Mickey here. You are listening to Wikipedia and this week on the podcast, I speak to Dr. Bill Harris, one of the world's leading experts in the field of omega-3 fatty acid research. Dr. Bill's work focuses on the roles that fatty acids play in cardiovascular and neurocognitive health. And we talk about omega-3s, their unique characteristics which make them so important for health, the difference between plant and fish omega-3 fatty acids, how best to measure them, and at what amounts we should be consuming them. We also talk about what the research shows in relation to cardiovascular disease and their neurological benefits. And after talking to Dr. Harris, there's you know, no doubt in my mind that this is something that we need to be focusing on more from a nutrition perspective, given the low prevalence of omega-3 intake across the population. Dr. Bill Harris is the author of more than 300 scientific papers on fatty acids and health, and we talk about how he got into the field in today's conversation. He's a professor in the Department of Medicine in the Sanford School of Medicine at the University of South Dakota, the co-inventor of the Omega-3 Index, of which we talk about in today's podcast, the founder of Omega Quant Analytics, and president and founder of the Fatty Acid Research Institute. And I've included notes to where you can find Dr. Bill Harris, and also a link to ResearchGate with his research articles. Just before we crack on into the show though, if you are after protein, clean lean protein, you can grab that over at www.newzest.co.nz and get yourself a sweet 20% off with the code MICKEY20. So uh, check that out if you're in the market for a decent hit of protein. The best way for you to support the podcast is to jump on, subscribe and share with your mates. That would be amazing on your favourite podcast platform. To take it that one step further, why not head over to my website, mickeywillardin.com, sign up to the recipe portal access, and you get access to my regularly updated recipe library, the Mickey Willardin Nutrition members only page, where we have Facebook Lives, weekly forums, you get the opportunity for me to answer any of your nutrition related questions, either over on Facebook or in the platform that the recipe library is housed in and you just get that general good feeling of knowing you're doing something good for yourself for less than a cup of coffee a week. That's pretty awesome. All right, team, without further delay, please enjoy the conversation that I have with Dr. Bill Harris. Bill, thank you so much for taking the time um, to speak to me this morning about your work in omega-3 fatty acids. And as a nutritionist and um, just someone who's generally interested in, in how food impacts our health, like this is an area that I get a lot of questions on and also that I'm interested in learning more about as I see things emerge in the research. So. Yeah. So I'm really interested in your work over the years and particularly, as I understand it, your sort of early introduction was in your postdoc work. Right, right. Yeah, 1978-ish. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about your, you looked at the impact of salmon oil on cholesterol levels, is that right? Yeah, that was our our primary question. We were uh, interested in trying to compare different kinds of oils and their effects on cholesterol. And other blood lipids. Yeah. Yeah. What did we know at the time about fatty acids when you were investigating that? Didn't know much at all about fish oils, to be sure. Um, we knew a lot about vegetable oils, and we knew that vegetable oils, yes, corn oil classically, uh, will if, lower cholesterol levels, lower LDL, the bad cholesterol, um, and that animal fats, saturated fats, would raise cholesterol. Mm. Uh, we were very clear about that. Uh, what we weren't clear was, you know, fish oil was kind of sitting there in mm. the middle where it's a, a liquid like a plant, but it's from an animal like a mm. animal. So um, I think that was the what was going on in my mentor, Dr. Bill Connor. What he, what he was thinking is, well, is it the liquid nature of the oil, regardless of its source, animal or vegetable or animal or plant? 
or is it the actual something about the source of the oil that's important in affecting? So that's that's kind of what motivated the idea of doing the study. Mm. And can you describe to us sort of what you what you did and and what you found? Yeah, we uh, recruited healthy volunteers. This was at the Oregon Health Sciences University in Portland, Oregon, and we um, then fed them. Um, well, we, we recruited them and told them we're going to feed them basically all of their food for a month. And we uh, we didn't keep them in overnight mm. or anything, but they had to come for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Maybe probably breakfast, lunch, and a sack, sack dinner, something like that. Anyway, we did that, and we gave them a lot of uh, three different phases. One, one phase was a vegetable oil-based mm -hmm. diet. One was salmon oil. And salmon, like they, I think they had two or three servings of salmon a day, mm -hmm. plus a, a little cup of salmon oil. Oh. So all of the oil, all the fat in the diet was salmon oil. Yeah. There wasn't anything else, which is extreme. Um, and then we had a, a phase where the same people did a uh, same kind of diet, except it was all saturated fat. And so we, I think we did it in probably in random, random order. Mm. And then we looked at the cholesterol levels at the end of each phase, and we found that uh, cholesterol levels went down on the salmon oil diet and on the and the vegetable oil diet mm. the same. Mm. And but what was unique about the salmon oil diet was the triglyceride levels went down, mm. which we didn't see on the saturated or the or the vegetable oil diet. Um, and we we interpreted our data like fish oil lowers cholesterol. Yeah. Which is probably not a good way to do it. Mm. Uh, we probably should have said sa saturated fat raises cholesterol. And if you take the saturated fat out, no matter what you put in its place, yeah. vegetable oil, fish oil, carbohydrates, doesn't make any difference. Your cholesterol will go down. Yeah, yeah. So it, it was not so much an addition of fish oil. It was more the removal of the saturated fat that caused the cholesterol to go down. Mm. And, and I say that simply because what happened then was the fish oil industry, supplement companies, started advertising that they their fish oil lowers cholesterol. Well, that's not exactly the study we did. Yeah. We changed the entire diet. Yeah, yeah. We didn't just give pills, supplements. Yeah, yeah. When, and how much fish oil would have been in a diet that had, was, you know, obviously you had the salmon oil, but the the servings of fish as well. What did that equate to in terms of fatty acid consumption? Well, it was in terms of omega-3 intake, we were giving them between, depending on body weight, between 20 and 25 grams of omega-3. It's a lot. Well, we didn't know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And you mentioned... <laughs> now we know Yeah, no, completely. And in fact, I've seen uh, protocols out there just in the um, sort of it's not alternative health space, but sort of with people who think outside the box in terms of fitness and nutrition. And, and I've seen like high dose fish oil protocols for things like fat loss and rapidly reducing inflammation and, and things like that. And I wonder yeah. how much, you know, except the, the amounts that they suggest, I think might be an eight to 10 grams worth, not necessarily like the 25 grams. That's a lot, right? And but even that—that's a lot. I mean, I, I, there there is good safety data for up to five or six grams mm. a day, and very few studies have been done up in that area. I mean, the only the only problem we saw uh, was when we were looking at platelet yeah. function in the same yeah. people because we were interested in in lipids and thrombosis, mm -hmm. both. So, so we were studying platelet aggregation, and one of our volunteers had a, a, a huge drop in platelet okay. counts and we, we had to pull them off yeah. the study because we thought what well, something's going on there was an there was an average drop a little bit in yeah. platelet counts and there was a reduced platelet aggregation um, because of the omega-3s replacing some of the uh, arachidonic acid making different um, uh, prostaglandins yeah. etc thromboxane prostaglandins but one guy had a big drop in platelet count, so we mm -hmm. don't know why. But we took him off, and we put a we put a picture of his graph in the paper, and it looked kind of scary. But it's, it wasn't the typical reaction; it was mm. him. I mean, we don't mm -hmm. know why. What What is the danger of having that big drop in platelets? Increased risk of bleeding, hemorrhage. Okay, like blood thinning type. 
Yeah, really yeah, yeah, thin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Bill, you mentioned that there was a drop in triglycerides as well uh, with the results from that early study. Did we mm-hmm. know at the time the importance of triglycerides or, or you know, how, how important a finding was that with your research? Well, we didn't know that triglycerides were important, particularly mm-hmm. important, um, particularly not in healthy volunteers. I mean, it was – so I think their, their triglyceride levels were something like 100 milligram per deciliter at baseline, mm-hmm. and they went down to 75. Okay. okay. Kind of like nowadays you'd go, eh, that's, you know, you're already yeah. healthy, 100 yeah, yeah. good. But um, nobody had observed a drop in triglycerides before. So it was kind of a novel finding. Um, and we, well, the, the thing that I think was more important, we also did the same protocol with people that had uh, a, a lipid mm. disorders, very high triglycerides. Triglycerides averaging like 1,000, mm. 800 mm-hmm. or 1,000. And when we put them on fish oil, it dropped like their triglycerides dropped like oh, a rock, wow. and that was a big deal. I mean, that's a paper we got in the New England yeah. Journal uh, because that was really a novel finding. But you know, people forget it was twenty five grams of omega three. I mean, come on, this is yeah. outrageous. But still, in nineteen eighty five, that's when we I think that's when we published that yeah. one. Um, that was a a big. Finding. And now, if we're thinking about sort of in your general terms of taking what might be a more standard dose, which might be, and, and we can discuss, you know, what a standard dose is, but I'm thinking maybe in one to two grams worth of, of fish oil, what kind of benefit to triglycerides would we see? With that, you might see about, it, it, the, the drop, it depends on the baseline level, the, the, the magnitude. If you're really, really high, two grams might drop it uh might drop at 15 percent yeah if you have a a normal triglyceride it might drop at 10 percent yeah um the the dose that's recommended for triglyceride lowering in those high patients is four grams okay yeah 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 three three and a half four grams is that at a level with which um uh it's not it's used sort of therapeutically if you like yeah right that, that that's to treat a Treat a disorder, yeah. a hyperlipidemia. Yeah. Um, what was the mechanism, Bill, for the – so if both corn oil and fish oil do very similar things in terms of dropping the cholesterol, what is it about those oils that make it um, – that give them that property? Uh, and, again, it's it's probably not so much about how they affect – um, biochemistry, it's more what does a saturated fat do? Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's kind of the flip side of the coin. Yeah. And what's, what high dose of saturated fat changes the the membrane composition of the liver, yeah. liver cells, and it af- affects the way the LDL receptor mm-hmm. uh, works in the liver cell. And that's the main way you lower cholesterol is by getting the liver to remove cholesterol, and the LDL particles from the blood. Yeah. And if that... Uh, if that system or that enzyme, that receptor is not working well because it's, it's stuck in a very stiff membrane, uh, it doesn't remove LDL from the blood. So cholesterol levels go up or stay up. And you really just kind of normalize things when you take the saturated fat away and put a polyunsaturated fat. Then the membrane works like it's supposed to do. And the LDL receptor works like it's supposed to. Mm. Okay. No, okay. That's interesting. So there's plenty of those sort of observational studies showing that saturated fat obviously as you say it sort of raises cholesterol then and then how strong is the research for sort of on that population level that that therefore increases your cardiovascular disease risk so is that actually a risk factor for most people cholesterol or saturated fat the whole thing the whole thing (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. For, you know, for decades, it was the mantra. It was it was a, a received truth that if you raise cholesterol levels, mm-hmm. you raise risk for heart disease. Mm-hmm. And there was good evidence for that. Um, but it got taken a little far because people finally started doing uh, sort of observational epidemiology and looking at the intake of saturated fat. And asking whether, you know, forget the cholesterol question, does a higher saturated fat intake um, automatically cause you to have higher risk for heart disease? Mm. 
And that's kind of come back as, well, it's not real clear. Mm. Um, the same kind of question with dietary cholesterol. Does dietary cholesterol right, increase your risk for heart disease? Mm. Well, we thought that cholesterol in the diet equals cholesterol in the blood equals increased risk mm. for heart disease. Well, it, it's not quite so clear when you actually look at, at population studies and, and look at their cholesterol intake or their saturated fat intake. Um, it kind of depends on if if what you're what you're taking out of your diet. I mean, if you want to lower cholesterol by taking saturated fat out, um, if you replace it with, I think, carbohydrates, you might not work so well. If you replace it with monounsaturated fat, that'll work, or polyunsaturated fat. But it, it's kind of a uh, it, it's a matter of what you're replacing. Mm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And you look predominantly at omega threes. So can we just sort of briefly describe what makes an omega-3 fat? What are the types of omega-3s which we know to um, uh, influence health more than others? Yeah, so what makes an omega-3 fat? I mean, the, the term omega-3 comes from the uh, actual chemical structure of the fatty acid. And, of course, a fatty acid is just a long chain of carbon atoms all stuck together. Um, with varying numbers of double bonds, or what we call points of unsaturation. And the omega-3s are unique. Well, they're not unique, but what makes them omega-3 is that the first double bond in that chain of carbon atoms, counting from the end, counting from the, and that's where omega comes from. Mm -hmm. uh, the first carbon is always called the alpha carbon, and the last carbon is the omega for the Greek alphabet, okay? So if you count in three positions from the omega carbon, omega minus three, that is the uh, structure that's common to all omega three. Every That's the last name of the family. Mm -hmm. The first names of the family, mm -hmm. EPA, DHA, DPA, ALA, those things are all um, to the other side of the molecule. It, it's either there's more carbons or there's more double bonds. Yeah. Um, but what's unique is that first uh, first double bond in the third position. Mm. Okay. And what types, what are the most common omega-3s that we have in our diet? Uh, alpha linolenic is the most common, mm -hmm. ALA, which is uh, a, a plant-derived. We typically in the West get it from soybean oil. Mm -hmm. It's the, a, the major source, although the, it, soybean oil is only about 7%. ALA. Mm -hmm. uh, you eat enough soybean oil, you get quite a bit of ALA. Mm -hmm. um, th there are oils that are very rich in ALA, like like flaxseed oil, yeah. chia seed oil. Those are in the 50% 50, 50 ALA range, but we eat very, very little, uh, virtually none of it in our diets. Yeah, It gets in, um, you know, it's in, in supplements and things like that. Um, so that's ALA is the primary. We're eating, uh, at least in the United States, roughly one and a half, 1.2 grams a day of ALA mm -hmm. it's on average. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, say 1,200 to 1,500 milligrams. Yeah. And our intake of the long chain omega 3s from marine sources, EPA and DHA, is like 100, 120 milligrams. So one tenth, roughly one tenth of the total omega 3 we take in is from seafood omega-3 and 90 percent from ALA. Mm. And which ones are the most potent for in terms of the health benefits of the omegas? Uh, the marine ones, EPA, DHA, mm. have the greatest uh, evidence for health benefit. There's there's certainly um, some evidence for a benefit of ALA too, but mm. it's it's considerably more muted, yeah. I would say. Yeah. And ALA is converted to the EPA and DHA, is that correct? Uh, to a small extent. Yeah. Um, in, the, in the neighborhood of, you know, it depends on the study. You can find, you know, 1% conversion. You can find 5% conversion. Mm. Uh, it depends to some extent on how much omega-6 is in your diet. Because mm -hmm. um, that will compete with that that. Uh, the best way to get EPA and DHA, in my view, is to take it. Yeah, directly. yeah, yeah. As a supplement. Yeah. yeah. Well, or fish. Yeah. yeah. I mean, 
we're, we're nutritionists. We'd like to always want to recommend food first, right? Yeah, but yeah, yeah. There's always some caveats to that. Yeah, for sure. Like I, um, I this may or may not be wrong, but I've been looking at studies or, or papers that talk about the genetic variation in people's ability to convert that ALA to EPA and DHA. And I believe there's some evidence to show that if your ancestors come from an area which was landlocked, you potentially were better at, or they were better at converting the uh, plant sources of omega threes to those longer chained um, EPA and DHA compared to those that were lived uh, coastal, which would have had easy access to marine life, and then they didn't necessarily need that conversion. Yeah, I think there's some there's some evidence to that. Yeah, yeah, uh, and that can certainly be the case. Yeah, you know. yeah. So, Bill, I. I also talk a lot to my clients about the um, about omega threes, and they are, they appreciate some of those health benefits, and we'll talk more about them in a minute. But they they take they either they're vegetarian, and so they're like, oh, I use chia or flax, and that's how I get my omega threes, or they take a supplement which is derived from flax and chia because of its omega three content. So, in your I suppose, I mean, you're the expert. Those are not efficient ways of getting those EPA and DHA. Not in my opinion. No, they're not the best way to do that. I mean, are, are they adequate? Maybe. Um, I guess the question is what's adequate? Mm. What's optimal? Mm. Um, we, we certainly know that you don't have to eat EPA and DHA to live and reproduce. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, look at vegan societies yeah. you know they they're there they they have babies they grow up mm-hmm. you know, they, they're okay um is their health optimal hard to say yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's pretty good um so I, I think for people who want to I just do the best they can i if, if they're vegan i just take a vegan source of epa or dha mm. they're available that's the algae product is that correct algae right yeah right. yeah so is that as potent a source of EPA and DHA as it would be from say salmon or mackerel or other fatty fish yeah it's the same molecules yeah, yeah. It's the same stuff um it's more more expensive it's just harder to produce yeah um but EPA is EPA is EPA regardless of where you get it yeah yeah okay no that's good um Bill, you've mentioned soybean oil. Uh, canola is often also, I think, said to be a good source of omega threes. Well, ALA. Yeah. ALA, yeah. Except, you know, there's also quite a lot of backlash against those oils because they're, you know, you hear industrially produced, they're very cheap, I suppose, and they're in food products which might be more processed and refined. And so, where is the evidence on the health impact of those oils because for a large like a, a lot of us sort of think oh they're not you know they're not the healthiest things that people could be having compared to say other types of oils like olive oil like coconut oil things like that so where where's the evidence lie as you understand it um for health benefits of things like soybean oil yeah like so or if if canola? I'll take canola as an example because you've got that YouTube video of how canola is produced um, and it shows it going through the chemical processes and having solvents and maybe that happens with all oils but for whatever reason it's you know on YouTube for canola Um, and then if the polyunsaturated oils have those more unstable bonds are they more likely to be Oxidize, and I think this is where a lot of the argument against um, oil, like an oil like canola, for its sort of general use in in food products and for people to to be consuming, that it's more likely to be oxidized and so less likely to be good for you. Well, yeah, I'm I'm not sure that logic follows. Okay, necessarily. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, if you take canola oil, it's very rich in monounsaturated fats. There's only the single double bonds. I mean, there's very little linoleic acid, the 18-2 okay. in canola. I mean, if, if you want to talk about corn oil or soybean oil, those are about 50%. Yeah, yeah. Like 182 polyunsaturated. But canola is not polyunsaturated. Okay, so um, interesting. Yeah, that's in my, I mean, I'm, I'm sure, yeah. 
I was obviously yeah. looking at something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's it's uh, it's very similar to olive oil yeah. in fatty acid composition. It's just that canola oil doesn't have as many of the the other polyphenols and things like that that olive. Well, that certain kinds of olive oils have. Of course, yeah. they're they can be processed up the yin yang too. Yeah, for sure. Where, yeah, yeah, right. Okay, so then um, with soybean oil, then so what's your view on people? You because it's in so many food products, like. Is it something that we need to that we need to be worried about, or with regards to its level of oxidation? I, or... so. I mean, I, I, of course, I'm one that thinks that that omega six fatty acids are good for you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that you know, a lot of people come to this space with the, the, they have this idea that the omega sixes are bad and the omega threes are good. You need to stay away from the omega sixes. Then I just don't think the evidence supports that. Uh, the, the, it, it became a mantra. Yeah, and everybody likes to have a good guy and a bad guy. Yeah, and so you know these are good, those are bad. Stay away from the. Well, they're not bad. I mean, the evidence that we've been looking at, which is looking at blood levels of of omega six. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure how far we want to run down the omega six trail here, but yeah, you look at blood levels of omega six in thousands of people mm. around the world, mm. and then you ask. Are are they if you follow them for ten or fifteen years down the road? Yeah, uh, are they more likely to get diseases or less likely? Mm. I mean, the people with the highest levels versus the lowest levels. Yeah, and so what we found was for both cardiovascular disease and for diabetes, I mean, two of the big problems. Yeah, people with the highest omega six levels in their blood are the least likely to develop those diseases. Mm. People with the lowest levels are the most likely. Yeah. So if that's true, then any recommendation that says you ought to eat less omega-6, less linoleic, is going to increase your risk for heart disease mm. and for diabetes, if this is causal. Yeah, yeah. And of course, these are observational. Yeah. But the the evidence points in the other direction. It points that higher linoleic acid intakes and blood levels are good for you. Yeah. So, so maybe maybe you can um, oxidize the double bond on a linoleic acid on an eighteen on an omega six. Mm. Fine. At the end of the day, I, I, there are thousands of different processes in our body that deal with these balances and can handle these things. Mm. At the end of the day, if the if higher levels of omega six are better for you or associated with better health, then I don't care what happens in a test tube. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so so what was the argument against omega six? Was it that oxidation and potential inflammation? Is that where that yes, lies? Yeah, the, that the, the 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 general idea is eat linoleic acid eighteen mm. two. It's the far and away the most common polyunsaturated fat in our diet. Mm -hmm. Eighteen two can be made into arachidonic acid. Mm. Arachidonic acid is a precursor for you know hundreds of different molecules, some of which are pro-inflammatory. Yeah. Okay. So eating linoleic acid raises arachidonic, raises inflammation. Mm -hmm. That's that's the logic. Yeah. Unfortunately, <laughs> there's great evidence that eating more linoleic acid does not raise arachidonic acid levels. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If you actually measure it, yeah. you don't just assume it. You just don't look at your metabolic chart and say, oh, I know why that's bad. Well, it's not. Yeah. And the other, and people also thought more omega-6 meant more meant less omega-3. And so that's bad. Yeah. Because they compete with each other for different uh, metabolic processes. And that's bad. So that can't be right. Yeah. Uh, uh, again, it it is generally true. The higher the level of linoleic acid, you'll have lower EPA levels. Yeah, I mean, it's not we're not talking vast levels, small differences. Yeah, uh, but not necessarily DHA. DHA doesn't get lowered by having higher linoleic acid. Yeah, so it's not nearly as as simple as people think. Uh, the I, I think omega six and omega three we, we call them like partners in prevention. Yeah, they're, they're both good. Yeah. And people should not be lowering their omega six intake. In in my view, I mean, now there's other diseases we haven't looked at. Yeah. You know, maybe maybe depression. Yeah. Maybe dementia. Yeah. Maybe uh, you know autoimmune diseases. You know, blah blah blah. Maybe higher levels of omega six increase risk of those. 
haven't really studied that very well. Yeah. And- in, in, so, but, but what we've seen of heart disease and diabetes, both of which have inflammatory components, mm. it don't work that way. Yeah. It, it's, it's good for you. Yeah. So. It's so interesting how these sort of mantras exist out in yeah, that sort yeah. of public sphere. And so it's, I can see how people get confused about all of the things oh, related totally. to, yeah, oil and whatnot. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Bill, does it make a difference how the oil is made? And I guess I ask this because um, I see, like when I look in the supermarket shelves, there is rapeseed oil um, that is cold pressed. So would that be a better choice than just your standard oil? What do you reckon? Yeah. So, so rapeseed is canola, essentially. Yeah. Um, and so cold press versus, you know, um, honestly, I don't know. Yeah. I, I've not really ever studied that question. Um, I I know people have a, there's this, I like natural, Mm. you know, yeah, yeah. uh, any, anything that a producer does to process something has got to be bad. Yeah. Uh, that idea. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if the evidence supports that. I, but I don't know that it doesn't. Yeah, you know, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I suspect that you know, I, I I suspect that it's one of the one of those urban legends again that just comes from people doing armchair logic about people always screw things up. Yeah. Therefore, non cold you know normally processed oil must be bad. Yeah, yeah. So here's our it's logical. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but it's it's not what you call evidence based. Yeah. It's more philosophically based. Yeah. No, I get that. And my philosophy up until about four years ago, well, I had a good probably six years of being a complete zealot for all things natural. And then sort of, as you all, yeah. as a lot of people do, you sort of like take this absolute stand on something. And then slowly over time, you're like, well, actually, maybe I'm actually. majoring in the minors and I really should be focusing on yeah. the big important things. Yeah. Right. Um. Bill, if we can get back to your research with regards to what you found in your early study um, with the fact that the fish oil didn't raise cholesterol and and dropped triglycerides, were we aware at the time of the Inuit population and their diet in relation to heart disease? Well, I wasn't aware of it. Yeah. Um, I mean, because I, I started these studies in 1979 and, and Dyerberg and Bang have been published in Greenland studies since 1970. Okay. For some reason it had just gone. Phew. Yeah. You know, I didn't know about it. Uh, we, we figured out pretty quickly that there was, you know, when we were doing our salmon oil studies, you know, you would find a little, oh, well, look at these studies from Greenland. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yeah. Um, so we didn't know that omega-3, uh, I didn't know that omega-3 was uh cardioprotective from uh, the Greenland experience. Yeah. Um, but we, we got on board with that idea pretty quickly after we uh, did our study, found what happened, you know, studied the literature more, yada, yada. Yeah. Can you describe for those that aren't familiar with the Greenland studies, what it is about that, that made it so interesting and so relevant to sort of your work? Sure. Um, The studies in Greenland were done by uh, Danish doctors. Um, Denmark actually was owned by Greenland. Uh, It's it's a county. At at that time, it was a county of Greenland. Um, Excuse me, the county of Greenland was a county of Denmark. Uh, So uh, there had been, uh, you know, reports that there was very little uh, heart disease or heart attacks Mm -hmm. among Greenland uh, Inuits. And uh, so some investigators wanted to know, well, why is that? So they went and studied a group of Inuits on the far west coast of Greenland, looked at all their food, measured their blood, you know, did everything they could figure out. And they didn't really, their plasma lipids were not all that different. Mm -hmm. Cholesterol, triglycerides, they were a little lower, but nothing outrageously different. Uh, But they found in the blood, these things, they, they analyzed the fatty acids in the food mm. first, it was, and of course, very much seafood heavy. And they found omega-3s, EPA and DHA. Mm. And then they looked in the blood and they found EPA and DHA. And they thought, huh, you know, maybe there's something there. And then they did some experiments where they treated platelets with EPA or arachidonic acid, which is the, the omega-6 partner 
and they showed that platelets were in the, the aggregation of platelets was really blocked by the EPA. Mm. So they went, aha, the reason there's less heart disease is because people have high EPA levels. Their platelets are not clotting. They're not sticking together. They're not forming blood clots in the heart, which is what they thought was the cause of heart attacks. Mm. Thrombosis, yeah. the, okay, blood clot in the coronary artery. So they're prevented. So the omega threes were preventing blood clots in the heart, and that was the theory. That's the way the line of logic went over the decade of the seventies that brought people to the idea that the omega threes are protected, cardioprotective. Mm, mm. So interesting. So that was. So you had the Greenland studies. You had your research, and then, as I understand it. Um, sort of mid 80s was when more research began to be published looking at that relationship between omega 3s and cardiovascular disease risk right right there was one uh, actually a day in may well, may i can't remember exactly the, the date may 19th maybe 1985 was the day the new england journal published three omega 3 papers back to back in one issue and one of them was ours looking at the effects on blood lipids in normals and in hyperlipidemic people and yeah. showing huge drops. One was an observational study from uh, Denmark, uh, from the Netherlands, yeah. uh, looking at fish intake and risk for cardiovascular disease and death. And they showed higher intake of fish, lower risk over 20 years, mm -hmm. the Zutphen study. And then the third paper uh, was looking at, uh, it was more in vitro looking at um, leukotrienes and other um, molecules that are made from e EPA versus arachidonic acid as in the inflammatory world mm. and showed that the EPA reduced the levels of these inflammatory molecules. Mm. So the, the three of them made a nice uh, trilogy of, of, you know, lowered lipids, lower inflammation, and here's observational studies showing less risk for disease. Yeah. So it looked, it's a great, great little. So that really sent the omega-3s up. I was gonna, is, is, what, did that start that sort of industry of fish, of fish uh, oil supplements? Well, they were there before, but they really got on. Oh, you would. They got on steroids after that. Yeah, of course. Um, and then as I understand it, it was a few years later where you actually had a study that showed that the fish oils increased cholesterol. Is that right? LDL. Where there was something sure, about when, a study. Right. When, yeah. you're not, when, you, when you're not substituting all the fat in the diet with salmon oil yes, and feeding people a controlled diet, if you're just giving them omega-3 pills. Yeah which is what people do, and don't change their diet. Yeah. Well, in that case, we didn't, we didn't see any cholesterol lowering. Mm. Uh, and in some patients, we saw cholesterol, LDL cholesterol went up. Yeah. And that was kind of a, uh-oh. What's going you know, on what's here? What's going on here? Yeah, right. And it, it, it turned out that in anybody who has high triglycerides, if you drop their triglycerides, even if you use drugs like fibrates, yeah. and you drop their triglyceride levels, they're LD, there has been a blockade in the in the path from the VLDL, very low density lipoprotein particles, to LDL. Yeah. So people with really high VLDL or triglyceride levels will typically have really low LDL mm. levels. Mm -hmm. If you fix that metabolism, the triglycerides come down, but the LDL goes up. Okay. Because you now you've broken the dam. And that's kind of what happened with the uh, omega three in certain types of hyperlipidemia. Yeah. And would that have increased their risk of subsequent sort of heart issues? Like, in, in, like if you fix a metabolism like that, you'd think that that would be a good thing. But I mean, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. right. Right. It, it basically brought their cholesterol levels up to normal. Yeah. And, but as a percent increase, it looked big and it looked scary. And if you're uh, of the mindset that if cholesterol goes up, your risk for heart disease goes up, regardless of anything else. Mm then you get scared about it. But I, you know, I, we never did studies where we gave six or eight grams a day, raised LDL and, and followed people for 20 years for heart attacks. Yeah. You know, yeah. You, yeah. You don't do that. Yeah. Um, so the evidence, uh, I, I think it does not, just because cholesterol, cholesterol goes up or LDL goes up does not mean you're at increased risk for heart disease. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I can imagine that would have been a, uh, was that a surprise finding from your study? Is that, how you yeah. sort of? I mean, we weren't the first to see it. There was a group in England that had seen it too. Mm. 
but we were um, we confirmed it and published it in a kind of a higher <laughs> in a journal they got more attention yeah yeah so bill sort of on on balance then like where is what does the sort of evidence say for omega threes and cardiovascular disease risks? So, so where are we at with that literature? Well, we know that uh, omega threes, both from randomized trials, we know that if you look at the, the full experience over the last thirty years, people who've been randomized to omega three have lower risk of death from heart disease. Mm-hmm. Um, they have lower risk for myocardial infarction. Mm-hmm. And we know from observational studies, I mean, those are randomized trials, yeah. which are not, which have their pluses and minuses. Yeah. You know. uh, they're short, high dose, starting in later, later, later in life. Observational omega-3 studies are ones where you look at blood levels of omega-3 mm. over decades and see what kind of outcomes people have. And in those, we also see higher omega-3, lower risk for cardiovascular disease and lower risk for really death from anything, mm. from all causes. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think the, the evidence is still strong that higher omega-3 intakes, which mean higher blood levels of omega-3, mm. uh, are protective against at least heart disease and diabetes uh, and reduces risk for uh, early death. Yeah. And what kind of intakes are we talking about here? So if someone is like, well, how much should I be having? Is it enough to get it from salmon? Is it, do I need to take a supplement? Like, Obviously, food first, but actually, what? How much do people need? Well, I th- I think probably if you're in the if you're talking about intake, we're in somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, a one gram a day, yeah, gram to fifteen hundred. I mean, that's a serving of salmon. Yeah. Okay. A, a, a day or every other day. Yeah. I mean, that's not outrageous. It's it's uncommon in America. Yeah. But it's not outrageous, and it's, it can be done with supplements too. Yeah. Canned salmon. No, fine. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Do you know, Bill, I was eating tuna yesterday and uh, and on the back of the tuna label, it had la- labeled out the, the amount of, or sorry, it detailed the amount of EPA and DHA in tuna. Now, good. it was good. It's very small though. Like, so I, I never recommend it to people as a, like, you need to up your EP, up your fish oils. So have salmon, have tuna. Like I'd never say that because I, I'm on of the understanding it's actually quite low in tin tuna. Um, well, the, well, yeah, it depends on right. Pink the the pink tuna is pretty low. Yeah. the albacore or white tuna is higher, ah, quite a bit higher. I don't think we have that as readily available here in New Zealand. Um, Could be. Yeah, yeah. Bill, you mentioned that the it's the omega three content of the blood that it, obviously, like you eat omega three, that's going to raise that omega three content of your blood. Um, Mm -hmm. and one of the, I suppose the risk factors that I've been aware of over my nutritionist career is the omega three to omega six ratio, which as you were describing it earlier, is it the competitive nature of omega six for the receptors in the body that mean that, that if that's too high, then we, we aren't able to uptake omega three so much Is that that's what people have sort of focused on, which might not be as important as we thought. I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think the omega-6 to omega-3 ratio is something people should pay attention to. Yeah. I think what they should pay attention to is getting more EPA and DHA. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you want to play the game of, okay, raising the raising the blood levels of omega-3 will change that ratio. Mm. Fine, change the ratio, but... But don't change the ratio by leaving omega three alone and dropping the omega six. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a bad way. Yeah, and that's you know if if you're ratio focused, that's a, a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But if you're health focused, is not a reasonable thing to do. Yeah, yeah, completely. And of course, you've developed um, the omega three index test, which mm-hmm. allows people to assess how much omega threes they've got. Um, in their blood and, and how that changes over time, right? Right, right. That's a, it can be done with a finger stick, a drop of blood yeah. um, on a piece of paper, and we give them the a level of omega 3, EPA, and DHA. Yeah. Uh, we actually give them the amount that's in their red blood cell membranes. Yeah. So the red blood cell is a, a model membrane, a very easy to access membrane. The omega 3s hang out in membranes, they do their business in membranes. Mm. 
And so to get the percent of EPA and DHA in the red cell membrane, we call it the omega-3 index. Yeah. And it runs r- roughly, people are somewhere between 2%, the very, very low end, and maybe 12% on the very high end. I mean, we've seen people higher than that, but wow, we, we recommend 8%, 8 to 12% is really the sweet spot to be in, Yeah, which is very uncommon in America and in New Zealand, I think. Yeah. Um, it's quite, relatively common in Japan where fish intake is much higher. Yeah, interesting. And so in your research, it's that the higher percentages, around that sort of 8 percentage, that's where you're at lower risk of cardiovascular disease events and all-cause mortality and, and those right. other markers. Right, right. That's 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 the place to if you, if you want to optimize, well, you know, if you want to try to go to 12% or 15%, you can do it with supplements. Yeah. Yeah, it's very hard. It's doable. But we don't know that that gives you actually any additional benefit. No. It's just a higher level. I, there's got to be a place where you, a diminishing returns. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for yeah. sure. And so, and I was actually just doing some um, searching online to see whether this test is available in New Zealand. Um, I believe there is a company that that might bring it in. I don't think it's as common here. Is it a common test for people to be able to sort of source in America or in other countries, Bill? Yeah. Um, it, and if, and I think I'm almost positive it's available in New Zealand through our website. You can just order oh, there you go. the test. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Through omegaquant.com. Yeah. You should be able to order it. Okay. Um, yeah. We're, we're certainly analyzing samples uh, uh, from Australia yeah. with some regularity. Yeah, nice. So. And do you have doctors um, and physicians aware of the test and potentially like using it with their clients or their patients? Like, is it? It's, it's uh, y- yes, there are doctors. Yeah. Are there very many? No. no. Uh, yeah, we've got quite a few, uh, th- what they call functional medicine doctors yeah. or maybe chiropractors, naturopaths, people who don't typically depend on insurance yeah. for their reimbursement mm. and, uh, and not part of a health health system or a hospital system where they have to use the laboratory at the hospital or they use the the big national labs. Uh, Actually, some of the big national labs are doing omega-3 testing. It's a different test. It's it's not the omega-3 index, but that's fine. I I don't really care. Um, I I like to see omega-3 testing available to as many people as possible, whether it's from us or not. Yeah. I mean, we can't do the whole world. Yeah, yeah. but people need to pay attention to a low omega-3 like they would pay attention to a high cholesterol. Yeah. Same idea. Yeah, completely. And Bill, we've mentioned EPA and DHA. I've seen supplements out there which are just EPA versus mm. a, a mix or there's some sort of, or they've changed the ratio of, of what might naturally be found, I suppose, in fish. Like, is there an advantage to taking one above the other for cardiovascular disease risk or is a combination best? Like, what should people be looking for? I, I don't I don't think they should be looking for a real heavy, heavy EPA or heavy DHA um, in, in fish. The ratio of EPA to DHA ranges from like two parts DHA to one part EPA mm. to the reverse, to, you know, EPA rich, a little bit more EPA than DHA or vice versa. But this always in the, you know, 60, 40, 40, 60 percent sort of range. They're both there. They both come together naturally. I think at this point, there's no good rationale for just focusing on one of the two for any given condition. Okay. Okay, no, that's good to know, um, because it's such a minefield out there with with uh, oh, yeah. supplements and what's right and and what's wrong. And in fact, here in New Zealand, a few years ago, um, it was uncovered that most of our fish oil supplements came from a just one particular laboratory or manufacturer, and all of them were oxidized actually. So, well, that actually got re- well. It got relooked at okay. by a di- by a different group and found that this was it was not that bad. It was not not as bad as that uh, that paper indicated. And that fish oil supplements in New Zealand, if the, if you just went to the stores and randomly bought boxes and bottles of them and sent them to a different lab, mm-hmm. you get a very different answer oh, than that one paper. So interesting. So, and that's been rebutted. Okay. Oh, that's good to know. So 
with regards to that, like, how would you know if you were getting something that was oxidized or not? Would you, like someone had said to me once, he just like bite it open and if it smells, well, I mean, well, it's not going to smell great anyway. It's a fish oil supplement, but. It's not going to smell great anyway. <laughs> yeah. 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 Even the most purified stuff doesn't smell great anyway. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of a marker. Typically the lower the um, amount of omega-3 per capsule. Mm-hmm. The less processed it's been, <clears throat> the more likely it's going to be. But, but oxidation is, is a very small component. I mean, I've seen, there was a study done in Norway to test the idea that oxidized fish oil is bad for you. That's yeah. the presumption. Yeah, yeah. You just you say oxidized, it's bad. Yeah. Well, they they took a big vat of fish oil and they bubbled oxygen through it for like three days. You know what I mean? It's outrageous levels of oxidation. Yeah. Crazy levels, way beyond whatever. And then they encapsulated it, and then they gave it to people for like, you know, four weeks. Yeah, yeah. Then they measured all kinds of lipids and inflammatory markers and oxidation. They couldn't find anything. <sighs> the body handled it fine. I mean, it, it, so it's, you know, the idea that oxidation is awful. Well, you know, show me the data. You know, th isn't that interesting, right? Because actually, our, like the human body is a completely complex, amazing no piece of machinery that deals with these things all of the time and 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 as you as you describe and you've said this actually a few times throughout our conversation like the body deals or the body handles or the body's got processes yeah. to be able to cope with yeah. this and and maybe you know there are of course differences in our levels of ability to resolve inflammation and maybe there'll be people more susceptible to to that than others but probably on balance that might be majoring in the minors to worry about that more so i would think so i think we, we spent a lot of time majoring in the minors okay yeah now bill there is just one other area which we haven't talked about which i'd love to know the lay of the land and that's the um, involvement of omega-3s in um in the neurological sort of area in our brain with depression um what is the state of research there um Kind of look at two two major branches. One is depression, yeah. as you mentioned, yeah. and the other is dementia. Yes. So they're different different things yeah, completely. Yeah, yeah. They're all above the neck, yeah. right? Okay. Um, in depression, uh, there's fairly good evidence that taking omega threes, particularly EPA richer products, yeah. um, not pure EPA necessarily, but mm -hmm. EPA richer, um, can reduce symptoms of of um, depression. Versus a placebo, yeah, um, better. So th there's meta analyses that will show that you know symptomatologies improve better with the EPA rich versus the DHA rich products. Yeah, and so that's that's interesting because we thought I mean, because the brain is so much DHA in it, just constitutively mm. part of the membrane, that people thought, well, you just got to give DHA. Well, not necessarily. Yeah. But on the other side, there's dementia. Yeah. Um, which we're all trying to avoid, mm. and there's there's growing evidence. It's a much much younger field, and a, very little research in it. But we're we we've got a paper that we're working on now that looks at omega three levels in uh, a large cohort in America, the Framingham study, mm. and looking at the DHA levels in the red cell as a marker of DHA levels everywhere else. Yeah, and we find that there's there are people with the highest levels of DHA in the red cells are lower risk for developing dementia oh, interesting. and Alzheimer's disease. So, and that's been, that was seen 10 years ago yeah. by another group. Um, uh, so it's, it's, we're kind of confirming what's, what's known higher levels of DHA for a long time should push back the horizon of dementia, yeah. which is really what we want to do. Yeah. What's happening there? Uh, why? Yeah. What's the mechanism? Yeah. 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 Um, Golly, it's hard to know. Yeah. It's hard to know. Uh, synapses operate better. I mean, it's tough to get omega-3s across the blood-brain barrier. Yeah. And exactly how that happens is not perfectly understood. Mm. And whether it looks like it might be what's called lysophosphatidylcholine or a, a, a particular molecular species of uh, DHA attached to a phospholipid that is how it gets in. Yeah. But once it gets in, what's it doing? Is a good question. Yeah. Synapses maybe work better. Maybe uh, you're making uh, 
some of your neurotransmitters are being uh, properly produced or or improper production is being fixed. Um, I don't think we really know. Yeah. I mean, we don't really know what causes aging or, or dementia. I mean, other than shrinking of the brain, but that's pretty gross. Yeah, yeah. Okay. No, no, that's that's really good to know. And and then with regards to the um, depression and the potential for EPA to have a slightly, uh, to be potentially uh, more beneficial, is that an inflammatory mechanism there, like reducing inflammation? Well, that's what you would think. I mean, if you're going to hypothesize something, uh, it would be the anti-inflammatory effect of EPA. Yeah. Um, although we were involved with a study where they gave a very EPA rich product to uh, depressed uh, coronary artery, coronary patients. Yeah. Um, couldn't find any effect on it at all. Mm. So it was kind of a bummer. Yeah. But, the, you know, and they were taking another drug too. So it was kind of to do omega 3 help that other drug, the depression drug. Yeah. So maybe those folks are too far gone. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but I don't think we, we know the mechanism of how the omega-3s work. Okay. I guess the, the important thing is to find out if they do work. Yeah. And then you can go look for a mechanism. Until you know they work, there's no there's point no in point. looking for a mechanism. Yeah, 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 no, totally. And the amounts of the EPA and DHA that we were discussing with cardiovascular disease and just, you know, what people should sort of look for, are they similar in the amounts that you're talking about with regard to depression and dementia and yeah yeah we think they are yeah that there's kind of a sweet spot for health in general yeah yeah okay and bill you did mention actually just um almost as an aside that you know we're not sure about the impact of omega 3s on things like oh sorry omega 6s on conditions like autoimmune conditions is there any good evidence for the um, omega threes helping with autoimmune conditions is that what made you yeah. think that? Yeah, there was a, even a, a recent paper from a, a big randomized trial in the U.S. called Vital. Oh yes, uh, where they they did actually find that both vitamin D and omega three were able to uh, reduce risk for a, a whole group of autoimmune diseases, and that was published just a couple of months ago. So they so what do they do in the immune system? Well, it's not so, it probably is, uh, don't know, mm. uh, but it's probably more the inflammatory response to an immune. Uh, and it, I mean, because inflammation and immunity are kind of yeah. woven together. Yeah. So if you can, if you have an effect, effect on the inflammation side, yeah. then the immune side doesn't get out of control as much. I mean, that's pretty simple way of saying yeah, it, but yeah. that's the idea. Yeah. Okay. Super interesting. And and then, of course, if we think about immunity right now, I mean, the next thing, uh, next question to ask is, oh, so is there any reason to think that a, you know, higher omega-3 content of your diet is going to be protective against um, severe illness COVID. from COVID? Yeah, right. Yeah, and, and we published some evidence that a higher omega-3 was protective against death from COVID in, in a very small group, 100 people. Yeah, interesting. But we, it was a... Uh, a year or so ago, we, we published that and found it. It's interesting, Bill, because I think, because I also wonder about long COVID and yeah. what, you know, what potential benefit there is of people just um, focusing more on the things that do what the omega-3s do, like the reduction in inflammation and things like that. Yeah, yeah. and it, it should have, if it's, if it's protective against the basic disease, it should be protective against some of these long COVID things. But yeah. it's very hard to study. It's, it's, it's so... It's a new disease. Yeah. So, you know, how do you actually do that? How do you, where do you find these people? And, and how do you, or you'd have to take a group of people that just got COVID and before they had long COVID, you'd have to get them on a randomized trial. Yeah. And then follow them for a few years and see who of those two develops symptomatology and that's i mean maybe somebody's trying to do that but at the, at the moment it's pretty tough yeah and i guess it's the the using your common sense around things like this like if you know that yeah. you know there are certain right. things that are going to impact the immune system impact inflammation then sort of you don't really need that to just suggest right. that hey it could be worthwhile and there's no reason not because the safety profile is right. good 
Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. That's the way to look at it. Awesome. Bill, thank you so much for your time this morning. I um, have really enjoyed our discussion and your enthusiasm. You've, you've been doing this for basically as long as I've been alive. And I still see <laughs> that you've got a real passion there for it. So, um, yeah. It's, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. No, it's been really great chatting to you about it. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you, Mickey. Enjoyed it. Bye bye. Alrighty team, hopefully you really enjoyed that. He is so passionate about what he does and given the fact that he's been in the field for almost as long as I've been on this planet, I think that is just testament to the amazing work that Bill has put out there in the omega-3 fatty acid space. Next week on the podcast, I get to chat to Dr. Rick Johnson, who is fructose guru and author of a number of books including nature wants us to be fat until then though team you can catch me over on facebook at mickey willardin nutrition over on twitter and instagram at mickey willardin or over on my website mickeywillardin.com where you can also book a consult or sign up to one of my meal plans all right team you have a great week look forward to catching you next week